So now, uh, in part two, we are coming back to the question of the kind of languages, right? So we said that for our stratified sample, sampling, we need to know our strata. And so uh, here is the, an overview of how we have been approaching this, right? And so I start uh, with this uh, relatively fun uh, classification that I found in uh, one recent paper. And uh, so you see, you can split languages in many different ways and everybody is saying this, right? So here we will just go over uh, uh, several options how we can do it. And so in this uh, classification, so you can uh, check it in the, the paper, uh, what it is about. So we have uh, raising stars, hopefuls, scrapings by and the left behinds. So I guess it's not so easy to guess the, the criterion uh, based on which uh, this classification was made. Or maybe it is. Uh, and there are underdogs and winners even. So in any case, uh, this is some kind of a summary view of the status of languages in NLP in the sense, in two senses, like, so how much people talk about it, how much there are, how many publications are there about some language, uh, and, and how many resources there are, right? So generally, like, so the, the left behinds, I put it here, there are most of them. So those are the languages that, you know, rarely, they are rarely mentioned in the literature, they're rarely studied, and that they have few uh, resources, right? And so on. So this is sort of a scale, and so, so it becomes a better and better, and finally we have underdogs and winners, right? Um, so so when I when I read papers like that, you know, I always think, oh, it would be nice to have some kind of a, like a measure, you know, some kind of a simpler criteria that we can say, okay, so I'm creating now a sample of languages, and I'd like to have in my sample like five languages of size one, six languages of size two, four languages of size three, you know, so some some measure that can tell me, you know, so for each language, which size that language is. But for the moment, this is actually really hard to find. At least there is no like uh, a widely accepted criterion that everybody uses. And so uh, we will see uh, further on what people are doing. So here's just a note that when linguists talk about size, they often, see, they often think about the size of the population of speakers, right? So not the size of a, of a language. And so when I said here, I, I meant something like, um, when we when we uh, talk about models, so especially these days, you know, when we have these large models and there is a lot of discussion about large models, so we talk about you know model size, right? And so sometimes I think oh, it would be really nice if we could somehow have you know the estimation of language size in the, in the sense like a model size, right? Like how many parameters this language has or something like that. So those things are uh, still uh, very very hard uh, to do. So uh, now this is what we are doing actually. And so this is the, the most common criterion. So uh, most of the time we talk about genealogical features. So uh, we actually have such trees which are uh, traditionally built in many different ways. Now these days they can also be built automatically using uh, uh, different information from uh, languages. But um, so, uh, in any case, they rely a lot on cognates, right? And so here's just a quick reminder of what cognates are, right? So those are the words that look alike across languages and they have the same meaning. So the languages that have uh, most cognates, that they share cognates, they are close in the tree, right? So that's the principle of the genealogical, of phylo phylogenetic trees. And then we read from these trees classes, right? So that's the thing. Um, we can read, we can, in theory, we can split this tree in different levels and have different granularity of classes. But in practice, what we do most of the time, we actually uh, take just the level of language family, right? So here, all these languages are one language family. And so uh, we consider language families as classes, right? So something like this. So we have this class, this class, and so all the items inside of a language family are considered to be similar or the same, if you like, in a, in a classification. So these are the, the strata, strata of our 
uh, for our stratified sampling. So here I just give uh, one quote that illustrates how people actually talk about these things. And um, so we regard the languages in the same family as similar and group them into one cluster. And so I also noticed that when uh, Eleanor was giving her talk, she was, you were talking about different languages, and you also mentioned how many language families you have in your sample. So people tend to be really uh, proud of having uh, multiple language families, and that's really great. Uh, and I have a feeling that you know the number of language family is actually the measure of uh, diversity more than the number uh, of languages. So here I took a table from this uh, great survey of um, many different uh, methods in uh, typology and computational linguistics. And so why I took this survey? Because it talks about papers that, that deal with multilingual topics, right? So we know that in NLP there are few papers still that are multilingual. But when they are, so people cite, you know, how multilingual they are. And so here's, they talk about number of languages and number of families. Yeah? So number of families is usually the, the measure of it. Now, uh, you can imagine that uh, what is, I mean, it's, of course, it is a measure of diversity and, uh, and a very good indicator of diversity. But here we can see that we have relatively few uh, languages in relatively few families are still, even if the work is uh, uh, termed multilingual. But now uh, the, the data are increasing and there are other probably uh, a, a, a survey like this in two years will have many more, many more items here, that's for sure. Um, one the problem with the language uh, uh, family as a category is the, the fact that inside of a language family, we actually can have quite different items, right? And so this similarity assumption, uh, yes, yeah, still needs to be really uh, understood and, and maybe even uh, you know, measured and assessed. Uh, why we, uh, when we see this, we see this, for example, when we want to uh, do transfer learning, across uh, families and then when we when we see that it doesn't work inside of a family actually and so that's actually the talk that uh, i think uh, yeah there was one of the talks here in uh, in this series where we could see that um, uh, projecting uh, universal dependencies or making cross-lingual parsers um, does not always work uh, across languages that that should be similar or in the same in the same bin let's say like that um, so uh, that could be, you know, because um, the similarity issue is really like when you think about it in, in uh, genealogical terms, it's a little bit like um, uh, trying to guess who is a cousin of who by by the way how people look. Yeah, so it's a relatively approximate, relatively, uh, you know, far approximation of similarity. So I think uh, some better measures of similarity and distance between languages are probably needed for what we want to do in NLP with, uh, with these uh, categories. But for now, you know, it's great to have all this knowledge and it's great to, to try to include it. And the, I would actually especially um, say that it's great that people are, you know, doing it and more and more. So, um, so that was, uh, you know, a short overview of what is really what we do most of the time. Now we will have a few options that we could do and that we do, uh, I would say, much less. Um, and so we can maybe discuss in the end why this is the case, or, or maybe you don't agree with me. So the second option is grammar features. So this is something that uh, a lot of people also do in NLP. So we extract uh, features from uh, walls. So that's this online database. And I'm not quite sure that almost everybody here knows it very well. <laughs> um, and so I will just briefly review here the idea behind uh, using uh, wall features. So basically, we use, we embed languages or texts in this case, right? Text in languages in a space, right? And then we uh, take every dimension of this space to be one wall feature, right? And so there can be more dimensions because people also convert those features, they split them, sometimes binarize them, and so on and so on. But the general idea is like this. So you have a, a highly dimensional space because there are like one, 192 features in walls. And then you embed each language somewhere there. 
And so once the language is in the space, then you can cluster them, right? Because you know which languages are closer together. And so you can create such clusters and then you can use these clusters uh, as groups for stratified classification. So that's the idea. But the thing is that, mo that not many people do that. So we rarely hear, okay, so I have clustered my languages and I have 11 uh, walls uh, clusters and then I use that as my language groups, right? So uh, people do use uh, walls features a lot, but for other things like predicting walls features, for example, or you know assessing the impact of uh, knowing about walls features uh, on on the performance of models like uh, for different tasks and and so on and so on but you don't have them like used explicitly for sampling uh, well most of the time not now uh, so here is just one uh, more illustration so how these features look like so here i just took two examples yeah 26a and 30a and so this is how the values are listed, right? So that illustrates, you know, a lot of people when they write about walls and then they, you know, there is a long description of how I, how I converted walls features into whatever I can work with. And so the first thing is obviously you see that this is a categorical variable. So you have to, you have to turn it into something numerical and often, often these numerical values, then you also have to turn them sometimes into binary and so on and so on. So people do a lot of, you know, uh, conversions in order to have such spaces. And another problem with walls, we will come back later is that, uh, yeah, so it's not, you know, it, it is a, a huge source of knowledge about languages but it is not uh, designed in the sense, you know, uh, with a view of coverage. So it actually gathers all that we know and this that we know, it's uh, not equal for all languages. It's not equal for all features. So there is uh, there are a lot of uh, missing data points, let's say like that. And people also have to deal with that when they use these features. Um, so um, another possibility is to use text features. Right, so this is now becoming more and more popular, and here is really one very simple, um, like a quantity that one can calculate really quickly, and that's word length. So basically, you can have a median or mean word length per text, and so you can then classify all the texts into like those with the long words, with the short, very long, long, short, and very short. So that's uh, just, uh, you know, my, my um, uh, example how one can split this space. And so here I give just uh, one like a uh, graph showing the distribution of median word length in languages that are given in this Connell Sigma Fon shared task. I have this graph because we did some processing for the share task. So this is why I, 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 call, I checked it. And so we can see that uh, the median word length is relatively symmetrically distributed. And for me at the time, that was a little bit of a surprise, I must say. So I, that's why I wrote here, I think it's an interesting fact in its own, in, uh, in itself. But uh, for sampling, it can be used potentially. So one can have just, you know, some bits from this distribution as uh, as groups for our stratified sampling. So, and this is something that I, I must say, you, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but I really don't see such approaches at all, while it could be relatively easy. Um, also approximate, but everything that we do is approximate. That's, uh, that's definitely the case. The thing is that you can do this for many languages and you just need text, yeah. Uh, another uh, related notion is text complexity. So this is something that is discussed much more. So we have a lot of measures of text complexity. And one of the most widely uh, discussed is uh, entropy, yeah? most of the time unigram entropy. So here, you know, I just for comparison, I calculated how unigram entropy is uh, spread over the same languages like uh, this uh, word length. And we see that the shape of the distribution is different, but they are actually, the two measures are actually correlated. Now I'm not explaining what entropy is because I also saw that there were talks here that talked a lot about entropy, but if, if there are you know, any questions, we can come back to that uh, later. Um, so, you know, in the same spirit, we can do uh, 
text with very high entropy, high entropy, low, and so, so like that. So we can use that as our strata for representing uh, languages. Uh, now, one um, objection that is often made to using text uh, measures is that text is not language, right? So text is just one um, um, manifestation of language. It doesn't really, you cannot really make this uh, equal sign between the two. And now we're coming to some of our work from my group. And one of the first things that we did, like in 2016, we actually tested this claim, right? So we calculated um, text uh, complexity using four different measures. We are not going to go into details here. This one is this one is um, entropy, right? Unigram entropy. So each of these lines represents one text measure. And here on the y-axis, we have the strength of the correlation between that, that text measure and a set of walls features. So in this case, we use only morphological features and we did all these conversions and stuff that I mentioned about. So we could actually calculate, let's say some, something like walls complexity and text complexity. Yeah, and we have correlations. So here we see, for example, that correlations are not very strong. They're actually quite weak, uh, which would go uh, in favor of this claim, right? And, but the thing is that uh, as we increase the number of chapters that are available, the correlation also increases. And at this point, it becomes really strong. It really is close to one, right? So, so the, the, the takeaway message here is that um, basically you can use uh, text features because they seem to represent same things that is already gathered in uh, walls as knowledge about languages. And so the, with the advantage that, you know, you could have texts for more languages and you can have more information for more languages. Now, the thing is that uh, this really works if you combine more walls features together, right? So here we have, you can see that, yeah, the, the size of this um, uh, dot is the, the, the number of languages for which we have the information. So as the number of chapters as the number of features is smaller the number of languages is bigger right so here we have relatively few languages but it's still 23 is the minimum right so we can still get some um, correlation out of this and so that's something that, that we did in order to justify a, a little bit our work on text because this is what we do uh, our group is called text group right um, now, what we are currently working on is uh, actually trying to get a bit deeper text features in the sense we try to analyze text using NLP, so basically uh, segmentation and uh, subword tokenization, that's one of, the, one of the techniques that we use. And so about this, I'm not going to spend much time because uh, probably you have heard those two talks uh, because they were actually in the SIGTIP workshop this year. So we have um, Jimena who works on using the notion of idiosyncrasy and productivity applied to subword units, um, automatically obtained subword units. And so she tries to use these notions to describe languages uh, and to classify them, you know, into bins. And Olga, she's actually come up with a totally new, new framework, so that she calls subword geometry. And so she's looking into uh, geometrical properties of subword units. Uh, and so that gives her a relatively zoom out, high level means for compa comparing different, uh, different languages uh, according to how their words look like. Right. So that's what's currently going on. And I hope that there will be some publications soon. And with this, we finish the part on kinds of languages, huh? which is the, the second part. 